Hello, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on uh, the fact that you're living in, in Europe or overseas. And welcome to the very first webinar of the Lati Technical Series. My name is Luca Posca, and I am the Director of Technical Service and Marketing for Lati High Performance Thermoplastics. Uh, let's wait a couple of minutes more just to let other people start their webinars. I see that the numbers are going up pretty quickly. So let me just uh, introduce myself. I work in LATI since year 2000 and I've always been taking care of technical stuff. Maybe some of you have already been dealing with LATI high performance thermoplastic and LATI technical service. Uh, today we are going to start a new series of technical webinars. During year 2021, we already offer to the market, to the European market, a series of nine webinars technical webinars. For year 2022, we wanted to open our technical discussion also to English-speaking countries, of course, and I'm taking care of all the English uh, webinars that LATI will offer during year 2022. So, let's jump into the, into, the, into the deal. For the summer of 2022, LATI is going to offer three technical webinars. The very first one is the one that we are going to see right now in the next hour. I will do my best trying to introduce you to the to the world of friction and wear in plastics, a very complicated and uh, let me say uh, tricky world. During the next webinar, my colleague um, will take care of introducing uh, technicians to the world of magnetically and X-ray detectable plastics as required by the medical and the food processing and the safety uh, industry sectors. And during the last webinar of this summer, we are going to talk about special compounds for 3D printing. So we will talk about 3D printing, but not from a, let me say, commodity point of view, but from a functional compound point of view. We will talk about how functional compounds can become 3D printable filaments and how they perform in actual working parts. For the fall winter, we have already planned five different webinars, all technicals, all technical stuff, no advertising. This is a very, let me say, I'm very proud of sharing with you the approach of LATI to technical webinars. We want to make very complicated topics as clear as and straightforward as possible. We refrain from complicated formulas, which are more or less pointless besides academy. We want to communicate and share with you our knowledge and we refrain also from advertising. So in our webinars, you will never find any kind of adver adver advertising about LATI compounds. We always uh, try to stick to technical topics as well as possible. At the end of the webinar, uh, your topics and your discussions and your doubts and questions will be more than welcome. So I strongly encourage you to, um, after the wrap up, to write the questions that you may have in the in the in the in the box in the chat box. So let's let's get it started and let's talk about friction and wear. What are we going to discuss in the next hour? First of all, we will try to better understand what are friction and wear and what are the causes, the common causes leading to friction and wear. We will have to talk a little bit about tribology, which is the science of friction. But of course, we will stay away from rocket science. We want to keep it, keep it straight and simple as much as possible. Then we will try to understand if friction and wear are the same thing. They are not the same thing, although they share a lot of common causes. We will talk about problems generated by friction. And of course, we will try to see how plastics can handle and solve the issues generated by friction and wear. Of course, we will have to better understand how do we create and select plastic compounds for self-lubricant applications. And at the end of our presentation, we will also try to talk about, let me say, the future of self-lubricant plastics. Now, let's try to get focused on the problem. Where does the problem start? Where does everything start? Everything starts from the surface of things. Whether you talk about sandpaper, everybody has the knowledge of sandpaper and every, all of us know exactly how does sandpaper feel when you touch it. Or the surface of a mirror. Even if the 
the sensation, the feeling that we have from the surface of a mirror and the, sur and the surface of a sandpaper is quite different. They both share a common issue. Their surface, if you magnify it with electron microscopy, just to give you an idea, will not show flat. They will always show rough. So the first point is that no surface is perfectly flat. Even the flattest surface that you can imagine will somehow show some roughness. And that's where everything starts. Roughness is the key factor, the driving force of everything. Wear and factor are those, gen those generated exactly on the surface of parts. Let's go a little bit more into detail. Let's talk, let's talk about what is roughness. If I try to imagine this surface on a horizontal scale, it will show more or less like a mountain landscape. I will have crevices and pits, and I will have, of course, peaks. The difference between crevices and peaks will, of course, somehow describe the roughness of the surface. I may try to, let me say, create the, an average profile, a mean profile for this surface, a mean line describing more or less what is the average between all these peaks and crevices. And then I can define how big is the difference between the mean line and those, let me say, peaks and, and pits. I can then define roughness as, an, as a mathematical, physical um, topic. Roughness is defined as the arithmetic average of profile height deviations from the mean line. So the formula is very nasty. It's looking very nasty, but don't worry because you can find this kind of um, dimension on tables where you have a class, a roughness class associated to the depth of pits and peaks. I want to focus your attention on the fact that even the flattest surface that we can imagine, so something whose peaks are below one micron, is somehow defined as rough surface. Now, what happens if I put one surface against another surface? Let's imagine I put two bodies in contact. What is evident is that the contact surface is not the geometrical surface of things. It's not how big I feel and I perceive it. It's something different. The real contact area is much lower because I will have roughness and roughness, and I will have peaks touching other peaks or getting into pits. But I will not have the perfect contact between the two surfaces. And this is absolutely fundamental because this is the main phenomenon, the, the driving force of the friction issue. So if I made if I make this kind of assumption, I have to consider that the geometric area of my part is much, much, much bigger than the actual contact area that is where the two parts will touch one another. The real contact area is much, much lower, much, much smaller than the geometrical area. And it will depend somehow by the roughness of the surface, and this is just evident, the rougher, the more coarse is the surface, the lower, the smaller will be the actual contact area. It will depend from the mechanical properties of the material by itself, of course, the softer, the more accommodating, the more soft will be the surfaces, the better will be the contact. And of course, it will depend, it will be affected somehow by the applied load. The higher is the load, the much, the much bigger will be the actual contact area. Now, how much? Well, the physics say that the actual contact area is related more or less to the load times two, two thirds. That's a pretty nasty number, but I want just to understand that the contact area, the actual contact area is related to the load that you put between these two surfaces. Now, let's move a step forward. What happens if I apply a load onto these two touching surfaces. A load, it may also be the weight of the part in itself. What happens? I will have this actual contact region, which will be affected by the roughness and the applied load. 
But what I have is that the ratio between the applied load and the actual contact area will be much, much higher than the nominal ratio between the applied load and the nominal, the geometric surface. This means that in the touching points, I can have a huge stress, a huge local stress. I can have a huge pressure because the contact region is so small and the wall load, applied load will be some sustained by these small regions by themselves. In those regions, it may happen that the local stress is higher than the stressed yield or the stressed break of materials. So what happens is that in those regions, I can actually somehow weld the two surfaces. So they get sticked one onto the other because of the stresses that I have in the, in the area. Okay, so what happens if I move the gray part, the upper part, what happens to those welded surfaces? What happens is that those welded surfaces will somehow resist to the movement because they are actually like glued one onto, on, onto the other. This resistance will generate overheating and, the, and local deformation, which somehow create a resistance to movement. So I can define friction and friction factor as the ratio between the resistance to movement and the applied load or the weight of the part in itself. So friction is describing how much the system is resisting, is resisting to movement. I can define a static friction factor if we are talking about how much it resists to start moving or a dynamic friction factor, depending on how much it will resist from keeping moving. moving. Now let's give a closer look of, at those areas because I want to really understand what happens in those contact areas because the phenomenon is generated over there and I want to have crystal clear what is actually happening in, the, in, happening in, the, in those areas. Let's see what happens if I have a rather flat surface. So the roughness is really very low and I have a really nice abundant amount of surface which is available for contact. I have a very nice amount of surface in contact and this is leading to molecular filling one the other. So I have somehow some kind of electrochemical adhesion between molecular. They are, they are very complicated names like hydrogen bonds, uh, Van der Waals, uh, Van der Waals uh, um, ties and so on. But I don't, do not want you to focus on the names or the, or the physics. I want, to understand that, want you to understand that with this kind of contact, you have somehow a very strong relation because it's an electrochemical relation. And this kind of, of friction is very, very strong. We have a typical adhesive behavior. The two surfaces are st like stuck one onto the other. You may experiment this just by laying a mirror onto another mirror. Try to move two mirrors and you will see how hard it is to move a flat surface sticking to another flat surface. If I put this on a diagram, I can see that the friction factor is higher, is as much higher as flatter is the surface. It decreases as, as a roughness increases a little bit. But what happens if roughness is much higher than that? Well, in this case, I will have a very minor adhesion phenomenon, but I will have that the peaks of the two surfaces will somehow uh, represent some kind of hindrance to movement. So I will have a huge amount of work required for a peak to overcome another peak. The gray peak will have to deform the yellow peak and overcome it. I will have local deformation and I will have a huge amount of energy dissipated as deformation work. On the first case, I had electrochemical bonds. On the second case, I have actual mechanical bonds, mechanical deformation. The graph of the friction factor is something like this. So I have a very nasty situation for very flat surfaces. I have a very 
problematic, but not as much situation for very rough surf surfaces. And I have an optimum somehow between 0 0.2 and 0 0.4 mark microns. In for this kind of roughness, roughness I have a 0 0.1 friction. Now I have understood what is friction. I have understood where friction is born and how, how it works. Let's give a little bit uh, a closer look to numbers. Normally for metals, you will see everywhere, you will find everywhere that static friction factor is higher than dynamic friction factor because it is more difficult to put something in movement than keeping it in movement. Plastics are somehow original. Polymers can be quite an exception. For many plastics, you will see the dynamic friction factor is higher than static friction factor. I'm talking about polymers. I'm not talking about compounds, which are a more complicated situation. Why do polymers show higher friction factor? Because they are quite peculiar from a constitutive point of view. Friction factor decreases as pressure increases, but with polymers, you will have an increase of friction factor as temperature goes up and as movement speed goes up. This is something that is very peculiar and is not so clear if you have just metals in mind. But plastics are something special because plastic have viscoelasticity. So you can really experience that. Plastic will behave in a much more rigid and brittle behavior in a metal, uh, more rigid and brittle way, the higher is the surface, sorry, the higher is the deformation speed, the stiffer will be plastics. The more stiff, the more brittle, the more energy will be somehow dissipated, the higher will be friction. This is the reason for higher temperature and higher velocity relation towards friction factor. We have defined friction. Now let's give a look at where, what is where. Where is defined as the progressive material removal from two surfaces in contact and in relative motion. I think this is quite clear. Where is an amount of material that you just scrub away from another material using a moving part. Let's try to define it in a more physical and more scientific way. Let's suppose that we have a plane, a surface perfectly uh, with a very known roughness. Let's put a solid block of plastic on top of it with an applied load. It could be this, the weight of the part in itself. And let's try to move it with a known velocity or speed and for a known time. Velocity times time means length. So we move it along a, a path of a, of a well-known length. What happens is that I can measure an amount of material which is abraded by the plane onto which this blue block, this solid block, is sliding. This volume is an abraded volume. I have scrubbed actually it away. And I see that it increases as the vertical load increases and it will increase also with speed and time. And it is quite evident, I would say. It will decrease as hardness increase. So the harder is the surface from a physical point of view, from a theoretical point of view, the harder is the surface, the lower will be the abraded volume. And also this can be easily understood. Let's create some numbers to describe this because we want to understand the idea behind wear and friction, but then we need some numbers, some parameters that can help us in our engineering and our design. We can introduce and define a wear coefficient, K, and a wear rate. So how fast does my polymer wear out once it is in working condition? Let's go back to our experiment. We can define a wear coefficient, K, I do not want to focus you too much on formulas. You will not find many for many formulas in our presentations because we do not like formulas. We want to uh, share with you the ideas. Then you can find formulas everywhere. You do not need a scientist here. You need something that can somehow introduce plastics and the behavior of plastics. So, but anyhow, the wear coefficient is higher 
as the vertical load is higher and the and the, and the, and the speed and, and time goes by. What is more interesting is the wear rate because the wear rate is defined by using some numbers that we can find on technical data sheets. Wear rate grows with friction, grows with the length of the path that I used to slide, and decreases. I need you to focus on this because it's very important. It decreases with hardness, and this is evident. It decreases with stress at break. Okay, but it also decreases with elongation at break. And I want you to focus your attention on this because this is not straightforward. Elongation at break, I could say that tough, resilient materials will also resist to wear. And you can experiment this on many polymer applications because I've seen uh, during my uh, work here in the technical service, I have seen many customers try to, uh, let me say, resist wear by using hard and tough and rigid materials. And the result is a worn out part. And the problem was solved by using a softer material, which is somehow capable of distributing applied stress. Applied stress to the crevices, to the peaks, the, this kind of stress is not resisted. It is distributed. We call it a collaborative behavior. The whole part, the whole plastic will collaborate to sustain the applied stress. And the result will be a part that can somehow resist wear. So do not fall into this mistake and think about that super hard part against a super hard part will somehow perform better. Because time to time, you will see that you need to distinguish and use a hard part against a soft part. To have the better performance. Now let's try to understand where we understood where friction is generated but now I want to understand where where is generated. Let's go back to the very flat na nice surface when you have an abundant amount of real contact region. In those regions please remember that you have some welded area some uh, adhesive behavior. When you put it in, in movement you will have the breakage of this, let me say, glue. You will have the breakage of the welded areas and you will have material transfer. You will have that the welded area will be sticking to one surface or to, to the other. And you can experiment this in, with, with, with plastic. In worn out plastic parts, time to time, you find one type of plastic sticking onto the other. And this is exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about. Please be aware of the fact that this phenomenon is the most popular when it comes to wear in polymer. So it is absolutely fundamental to take care of very flat surfaces, which can behave in a very nasty way with, with, with plastic. What happens if you have a rough surface? In case of a, of, of a rough surface, what you have is that one part can be harder than the other, so it can somehow groove or crack or cut small chunks of the softer part. So you will have proper abrasion. You are abrading your part. So the gray part here, which is much harder, it could be metal, steel, will cut the yellow surface, could be plastic, could be wood, could be leather, whatever, and it will groove it. This is abrasion. But you can also have another phenomenon. You can have the so-called pitting. What is pitting? Pitting is breakage of the softer plastic because of fatigue. So you are not actually cutting chunks out of the yellow part, but you are actually removing chunks of plastic, of the softer plastic, because of fatigue phenomena. So you do you deform, 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 keep deforming this situation will lead to fatigue, fatigue will uh, initiate cracks, and some parts will be somehow removed. Pitting is very uh, common in unfilled plastics, like acetal, like nylon, like uh, polyesters, where you have unfilled plastics, you can have evident pitting phenomena, especially along the, uh, the, the flanks, let me say, like uh, the flanks of, of a gear, you will see pits, actual pits dug by 
fatigue phenomena. The third phenomenon that you can experiment when it comes to wear is the so-called third body abrasion, which is very nasty. Third body abrasion occurs when you have a foreign particle. It could be it could be sand, but it could also be glass fibers abraded from a glass fiber reinforced piece of plastic or carbon fibers, which are nasty as well, but not as nasty as um as glass fibers. In case you have these small glass particles being abraded from one of the two parts, this dust, this mineral dust, will stay between the two sliding parts and will make a real disaster because it can actually cut both the gray part and the yellow part. You can really see this and experiment this in case of a glass fiber reinforced piece of plastic digging, uh, scratching aluminum or even steel. It's the glass. It's the glass leading to the so-called third body abrasion. Now, we have tried to create, uh, to make an overview about a very complicated phenomenon, which is friction and wear. As you can see, this is a drawing from Leonardo da Vinci dated back in 140, uh, the 1500. So friction is a very well-known phenomenon and it is a very complicated phenomenon. First of all, it is very complicated because it is a so-called non-conservative phenomenon. What does non-conservative mean? Non-conservative means that friction will dissipate mechanical energy as heat. And wherever you have some kind of dissipation of heat, you have uh, the entropic term rising and you have a real messy situation when it comes to proper describing it from a physical point of view. Very complicated to describe all phenomena leading to heat generation by deformation, fatigue and so on. Then you have phenomena which are affected by far by test condition. They are affected by materials, of course, and they are affected by the situation in itself by the testing method. What are the results? The result is heat production. You know this very well. You can experiment is just by wrapping up your hands. If you wrap up your hands, you will feel they become hotter as time goes by because your friction is creating warm, is creating heat. If the heat is too much, you will have polymer degradation. You can really melt the polymer or oxidize it. You can lose, of course, you can lose efficiency in your machine. You know, friction is sucking a lot of power from your engine, from your electric motor, from your gear system, and you're losing a lot of efficiency. This energy becomes heat, and it is a very big problem. And the nastiest of all, friction is the main reason for noise and vibrations. And uh, you know, the this, this squeaking noise of plastic gears, well, that's friction. So this is something that we really want to deal with and we really want to solve it. Be before solving it, we have to learn how to measure it. And measuring wear and friction is a really tricky business. There are norms, but those norms work only in extremely well-defined situations. Vertical load must be well known. The temperature must be really controlled and the relative speed between the testing part and the tested part must be fixed and well known. There are plenty of norms for testing friction. LATI is using the two that you are seeing above, but we are also working, uh, sticking more and more to the pin on disk method, which is the one that is showing the picture on the left. I will not lose time in describing how does the method work. It's really straightforward. It just you just slide the plastic part onto a pin, and there is a sensor assist a sensor system which is measuring the temperature, the wear, and so on. I want you to focus your attention on what what is actually available on the net. Whether you look at LATI technical data sheets or uh, RTP or DSM or whatever, you will find wear factor and friction coefficient. But how do I read those numbers? They are not like a weight or a density. They are tricky numbers. So how do I read it? The wear coefficient, we can say that a, 
an excellent wear coefficient is 30 times 10 minus 7. If the number is lower than that, then we are dealing with an excellent wear resistant product. Friction. I would recommend not to stick to static friction factor because it is extremely difficult to measure. I would focus your attention and the attention of your engineers on the dynamic friction factor because it is something that is, me is measured once the two surfaces have properly burned in and it is a more reliable number. Anyhow, a really reliable friction factor, a satisfactory friction factor is below I would say 0 0.15, 0 0.17, uh, 0 0.2 is a little bit uh, high, but 0 0.17, 0 0.15 is a very good, excellent performer. And of course, pay attention to norms because these numbers make sense only if the norm is just exactly the same. So just to understand how to handle these numbers, now I have understood what are the, let me say, the boundaries, the meaningful numbers, but what are these numbers telling me? I want to put the stress on a very important topic. These numbers are not physical properties of the materials. They are not like density, like a, a coefficient of linear thermal expansion. They are not physical properties of the materials. So, they have a sense only if calculated in a comparative way following the norm and uh, for this very reason they must be used for comparison use friction and wear numbers just to compare a to b i strong i would refrain from putting these numbers in project requirements because they have sense they make sense only if you state all the boundary conditions, temperature, speed, uh, load, and so on. Otherwise, you are making a mistake. Of course, it is also important to underline the fact that it is, for this very reason, it is extremely complicated to find the general rules. The general rule, the thumb rule about plastic polymers, self-lubricant plastics, there are no thumb rules. There is a more or less, but testing, testing, and testing is the only way to have a really successful engineering application. Selecting is difficult, coupling is even harder. So coupling plastic to rubber, plastic to wood, plastic to metal, plastic to plastic is a real nightmare. Testing is the only way. The meaning of numbers. In this table, I wanted to summarize some numbers I found on the internet because I want to, let me say, I want to focus on some thumb rule which are normally accepted and can be of real help. The first thumb rule, do not couple the same material with itself. So unless you are making a toy or something like that, if you need a properly performing power transmission or whatever, refrain from using the same plastic one onto the other. As you can see, the same material, whether it is a steel or aluminum or nylon, the friction will be higher. Why? Because of course, there is no material more, uh, let me say, compatible, more adequate for adhesion than the material in itself. So aluminum will stick to aluminum, steel will still stick to steel and so on. Do not couple the same material. Second thumb rule, hardness does not always mean resistance. I already told you this. I've seen plenty of situations where you have high local stresses, like in camshafts or with gears, wherever you have stresses concentrated in one point, you have a much better performing situation in case of a softer material than in case of a much harder material. So please act accordingly, select accordingly. There's something obvious. Lubrication vastly reduces friction. This is evident. And we will see how we can lubricate plastics with plastics. Polymers can work as lubricant. You can see that the friction factor of nylon versus nylon or even nylon versus uh, uh, PBT or whatever is very low. Normally is below 0 
when you have 0 0.7 for steel. So polymers can work as lubricants. If you have to select an amor a plastic, refrain from selecting amorphous polymers for friction and wear resistant applications. I've never seen gears made out of polystyrene, ABS, uh, sun, polycarbonate, whatever. If you need proper power transmission, you have to use semi-crystalline polymers because the crystal light, the crystal area is more resistant from a both mechanical and chemical point of view. Another thumb rule, chemical inertia will help to reduce friction. What is chemical inertia? Is where, whenever you have a plastic that is not reacting with anything like PTFE, like acetal, like peak, all those plastics that normally cannot be glued, these plastics are chemical resistant plastics. Why does chemical inertia help to reduce friction? Because they will not stick. That's absolutely straightforward. Of course, polymer combination, combining polymers can improve the performance of polymer versus friction. And that's exactly what we are going to talk in the later slides. And the last thumb rule I would say is to carefully evaluate your couples. Remember that for every mating couple of material, you have a proper friction factor and the combinations are more or less endless. So act accordingly also in this case. How do we traditionally solve this problem? By lubrication. What is lubrication? It is the typical drop of oil, drop of grease. You have a third substance that is somehow keeping away one surface from, from the other. What happens with lubricants? Too bad. Lubricants dry up. They dry. They become uh, not working anymore just because the solvent part, the volatile part just goes away. Lubricants can build up a lot of dirt. So in Greece, think about a bike. In your bike or in your motorbike, you can have dust building up in the grease of the chain, of the gear transmission in the chain, and this will lead to abrasion. So you have a nasty situation with third body abrasion promoted by, by grease and oil. Then you have to maintain grease. You have to keep on adding grease as it dries or, or as it is removed somehow. And then you have environmental problems because grease and oil are nasty substances nowadays. So the goal of uh, plastic compounders is to produce solutions that can work even without lubrication, the so-called dry solutions. What are, what are traditional dry solutions? A traditional dry solution is bronze, or PTFE coated steel is also a very traditional solution. But we want to move a step forward. We want to use metals only where necessary and we want to stick to plastic. So let's give a look at what are the best self-lubricant polymers by themselves. The best self-lubricant polymers are those which resist adhesion normally. Chemical inertia, high crystallinity and high thermal resistance. Please remember that also high thermal resistance is a, an extremely important parameter to promote resistance to wear and friction. What does high thermal resistance mean? It means high glass transition temperature. We want the glass transition temperature to be as high as possible because when the things get bad, when the heat starts to develop, we do not want to deal with plastics that somehow soften. We want to have our sturdy material keeping reliable and we want to have a good mechanical resistance also when the temperature goes up. So all in all, I would say that the best compromise between these requirements is represented by uh, polyethylene, polyolefins in general, Acetal, and you know this very well, acetal homopolymer or acetal copolymer is the king of self-lubricant plastics. Then we have PEAK, of course, which is an extremely expensive high-performance plastic, and PTFE. PTFE is the king of self-lubricant additives, or if you have uh, 
uh, if you are so unlucky to machine pick, you can also machine parts, self-lubricant parts out of solid pick. It's a very, very important business. Just a step below, you have nylons. You have polyamide 4.6, which is an outstanding material, a really outstanding material. Latit does not sell or compound polyamide 4.6 but it is one of the most performing materials and one of the most complicated to replace because of its outstanding performance. Then we have PBT and polyamide 90, which is an, which is an aromatic polyamide, like a PPA. Who are the no-nos? The no-nos are the polycarbonates, polysulfons, polystyrene ABS. Time to time, I have some customers asking if they can make gears of or bushing out of solid ABS. Unless you are talking about a toy, then forget. Otherwise, forget it. Always select semi-crystallines and possibly select one of the of the matrices I'm showing here: nylons, peak, PBT, acetate. Let's give a look at the additives because these plastics by themselves may not be enough. The king of additives is, is PTFE, polytetrafluoroethylene, also known as Teflon. Teflon is a DuPont trademark, but Teflon is a nowadays is a very well-known common term used to describe PTFE. PTFE is dispersed as a powder in the melt polymer, and as the surfaces try, start to slide one onto the other, you will have an abrasion on the surface, of course the PTFE particles will pop up and will be somehow, let me say, squeezed, squeezed between the two surfaces. We will see that after a proper burn in, PTFE will be somehow squeezed on the, on, on, on the surfaces. The gliding performance will be much, much, much better because you will have a PTFE film transfer from one material onto the surface of the other. And so you will have PTFE against PTFE. Very nice situation for friction resistant, friction resistant applications. So where do you use PTFE? You can use it more or less everywhere, but not everywhere. PTFE is very good for all around solution. It is effective up to 20%. We normally refrain from going up to 20% weight. A real advantage of PTFE is that you can use it on all polymers, from polypropylene up to peak, because the thermal resistance of PTFE is so good that it, it will not degrade, it will not ruin also in peak at 370 or 380 degrees C. It will still be an intact molecular, still performing very good. Which are the contraries uh, of PTFE? PTFE leads to mold deposit time to time. And if it is stressed too much, it can release harmful, harmful substances, very corrosive substances, with, which can be dangerous. But you really have to stress it quite a lot. It is an halogen-based polymer. So in all applications where you have to refrain from using uh, halogens, you cannot use PTFE, you have to use something else. It requires burn in, and please be aware of the fact that PTFE acts as a nucleant for semicrystalline. So it will somehow boost shrinkage. You can have an extra 0 0.1, 0 0.2 shrinkage just because of PTFE. Very good for high pressure, low speed application, possibly working always in the same direction, like the pump I'm showing in this picture. For, a, let me say, for a health-related ch uh, choices, LATI does not develop any compound based on perfluoropolyether, which are the fluorinated oils. We do not use any fluorinated oil because we want to stay away from anything that can be uh, somehow uh, complicated to deal also from our workers. Second additive, silicon oil, very popular. Silicon oil is also dispersed in the melt polymer, more or less one, two percent, no more than that, otherwise you have a mess. In time, the oil, the oil will be 
squeezed out of the polymer and it will pop up on the surface. It will stick to the surface. So you will have a permanent layer of silicon oil found on the surface of your part. This persistent layer of oil will work absolutely wonderful to reduce the static friction factor. So all, in all situations where you have, let me say PTFE, just to give you an idea, PTFE normally can stick, can suffer from for the stick slip phenomenon. Just adding a, a few drops of silicon oil will reduce the burn in and will reduce the stick slip phenomenon. So it is very good with PTFE. It should not be used in case of surface treatments like painting or uh, let me say uh, ink writing or something like that. And it should not be used in the electrical sector because it can foul, it can really lead to, to contact issues from the electrical point of view. Otherwise, you can use it for all low pressure, high speed. So remember, PTFE works very well for high pressure, low speed. And this guy here works very well for low pressure, high speed. If you mate the two with a 2% silicon oil, 1, 2% silicon oil and a 50% PTFE, you have an outstanding performer for both static and dynamic friction. Another family of additives, molybdenum disulfide and graphite. Molybdenum disulfide, moly, as known as moly, and graphite have the same lattice structure. They are independent planes which can slide one onto the other. The same structure is shared also by hexagonal boron nitride, which is a high-tech ceramic, very popular in the military industry. Uh, we use it for some self-lubricant plastics. Uh, mm, it works more or less as graphite, but it is very clean, so it is used for very specific application. All these additives have this peculiar independent layer lattice structure, which works very well as lubricant. The layers can slide. The sulfur of the molybdenum disulfide is somehow compatible with metals, so it reduces wear onto metals. And please remember that molybdenum disulfide also works as lubricant, as nucleant, sorry, for polyacetal and for nylon as well. So it is actually boosting the amount of crystallites that can be found on the surface. So molybdenum disulfide is absolutely excellent for, let me say, cheap, good performing polyamides, also glass fiber reinforced or acetal, which are very good nucleation with a very good amount of crystals, and especially in case you have to deal with plastics against metal situation. Here is a summary of what I was talking about. Too bad the both have dark colors. So one is dark gray, the other one is deep black, but the advantage is that they both provide dimensional stability, good nucleation, good uh, tolerance um, of, uh, of parts, and they are both cheap and perform very well from a self-lubricant point of view. Graphite is especially working very well with uh, water, with pot also with potable water. You can see two applications here, bushing made out of graphite and uh, uh, a bearing cage made out of glass fiber reinforced molybdenum disulfide lubricated polyamide. One of the most performing fillers when it comes to self-rubrication and wear resistance is aramid fibers. What is aramid fibers? Maybe you get it a little bit faster if I call it Kevlar, but Kevlar also in this case is a DuPont trade name, uh, but you know, everybody knows Kevlar as Kevlar. So aramid fibers are a dust made out of the same uh, um, structure of, of Kevlar. They are dispersed into the plastic and they are extremely soft, extremely gentle onto other surfaces. They are absolutely working perfect with PTFE and will somehow reduce wear as much as possible. So they are used by themselves. 
We do not use it with abrasive particles like glass or carbon fibers, of course, because it would be a nonsense to use an abrasive uh, substance like glass with a typical non-abrasive self-lubricant as color. So we use uh, aramid fibers and PTFE by themselves. Where do we use it? In non-structural wear resistant applications like bushing for robotics in the military industry you can use it wherever you have a part that must uh, resist continuous sliding but no structural performance because this kind of kevlar is dust so it is not providing any kind of mechanical stiffness completely different uh, approach for carbon fibers carbon fibers are a structural structural filler they will provide an outstanding reinforcement, but they also have a somehow graphitic structure. So can, they can also be somehow self-lubricating and they are less abrasive than glass. So in case you need a very top performing, top notch structural piece of plastic made out of a self-lubricant um, compound, just go for carbon fibers. Carbon fibers will provide super elastic modulus, super stressed brake, and the self-fabrication at the same time, and conductive electrical conductivity. Don't forget that because it can be very nasty. So carbon fiber is perfect for metal replacement, for very tough, very top performing structural parts, which can also have some extra self-fabrication. Please remember that you can find on the market plenty of solutions, carbon fiber field compounds, which are also featuring Teflon and silicon oil together. So you have absolutely structural and top performing self-lubricant wear resistant parts. The last of the additives I'm going to show you is the so-called ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. What is that? The name of this uh, substance is uh, on the market is uh, Dyneema. Maybe you can find it as a dy Dyneema. It is a polyethylene with a very high molecular weight, it is working as a super wax, something like that. Where do we use it? We use it to replace PTFE for all those situations where allogens are not allowed and they are becoming less and less allowed, especially in the, let me say, in the so-called sustainability chain and, and the circular economy. Wherever you have to deal with, with, with allogen-free self-lubricant plastics, this kind of polyethylene can really provide an outstanding performance. It will replace PTFE very well. The problem is that it cannot withstand temperatures above 300 degrees C. So it can work on many plastics like polyamides, PBT, PET, and so on, but it will not be uh, used with some PPS, PPA, PEAK, or plastics that melt above 300 degrees C. So excellent for allergen-free applications. So now let's try to wrap up our discussion here. We have seen what is friction, what is wear. We have seen what are the, the thumb rules of, of plastic compounds. We have seen what are the, the best performance, the best performing uh, matrices, some additives. Now let's try to focus on some key concepts. If I had to create a table to build your own self-lubricant, I have to put mechanical performance on the x-axis and thermal performance on the y-axis. Now, I put the resins on the y-axis like this. It is an automatic decision, automatic, automatic solution. You can see that you have polyolefin at the base and peak at the top of this, of this, uh, of this graph. If I want to have more mechanical performance, I will introduce mineral fillers, glass fibers or carbon fibers. What happens if I need to add some extra lubrication? The king is PTFE or PTFE and silicon. You can use it with peak or with polypropylene. You can use it with filled or unfilled resin. You can use it everywhere in every case. Aramid is something different. We normally sell it and provide it only with unfilled plastics because anything you mix with Aramid, besides PTFE, will create problems. So Aramid is very good for unfilled, high-performance technopolymers. 
molybdenum disulfide can be used with acetal or nylons on both the unfilled side or the reinforced side. We sell also uh, molybdenum disulfide polyamide 66 featuring up to 50% glass. So you can have a super structural performing cheap metal replacement plastic, which is also self-lubricant. And then graphite. Graphite is used more or less everywhere. Uh, you can use it also with carbon fibers, with glass fibers. Together you have some extra lubrication with dimensional stability and mechanical performance. Now, if we move the last step forward, let's focus on the winning grades. Now, let's, let's suppose you have to select some self-lubricant plastic. How do you select it? Let's, let's imagine that you know nothing about plastics. If you want to have the lowest wear, so the top wear resistance situation, you have to go for aramid and teflon. Aramid filled and teflon filled plastics. Not aramid with other fibers, aramid and PTFE. You will have the lowest wear. If you want to have mechanical resistance and lubrication, go for a carbon or a glass fiber field 30% with PTFE, 15% PTFE. Not below that, not above that. 50% PTFE, 30% glass or carbon is the best compromise. If you want to have top performance from a both a thermal, dimensional stability, friction and mechanical point of view, you can choose a PTFE carbon graphite, maybe on peak base. This is a 10, 10, 10 peak based top performance when it comes to also dimensional stability. Just one step below that, you can replace metal with self-lubricant structural plastics, just opting out for a nylon 66 molybdenum disulfide, 30 or 50% glass. You will have a very cheap plastic performing great also from a structural point of view. Or if you need some extra dimensional stability, you can select graphite PTFE compound, maybe on PPS. You will have best friction resistance and very good dimensional stability. What are the entry level guys in this, uh, in this, in this uh, table here? Silicon, so you have a normal base resin, PBT or nylon with a drop of silicon or with 5% PTFE or you can select uh, acetal or polyamide with just molybdenum disulfide. This is the entry level, the first step into the magic world of self-lubricant plastics. Now, I really hope I was able to give you a good overview. We still have time for questions. I will welcome any kind of question you may have right now, or if you haven't any, I really encourage you to send me to my email all the questions that you may have. I am really very happy that you have been following uh, the whole webinar. So I'm really look looking forward to meet you also at the next session that we are going to offer in uh, two weeks about detectable compounds for safety application. I really thank you for attending this uh, LATI webinar and I looking forward to meeting you the next webinar in two weeks. Thank you so much. And if you have questions, please remember to send to, to my email. For the moment being, I see no questions in the chat box. So I say goodbye and uh, meet you the next time. Bye-bye.